these things start actually broadcasting and recording. Yay! Okay, I think we're live. Welcome to my brand new masterclass, which I'm very excited about because this topic gets me very angry. This topic gets me very passionate and I'm going to, I have notes, I'm going to try and <laughs> give you a whole lot of value, but also really practical advice. So we are talking about shifting the household balance from, uh, you know, every time you walk in a room and you see something that needs to be done or that nobody else has done, or that maybe someone else has created more mess that they don't expect anyone but you to pick up. Uh, two, ah, you walk in a room and you're like, oh, that's still tidy. Oh, someone picked that up. Ah, this is what we're going for. And when I talk about household, uh, because, you know, 2020 happened, so many of us are now living in our homes with our family 24 seven, um, if not practically 24 seven, a lot more than we ever have been. We are not getting out the way that we always used to. We aren't having the space and time and the routines that we always used to. And so all of us in our households have needs that are likely not being completely met or not in the same way, or we're still grieving the changes that have happened. So I just feel like this is such a, an important time to be having these conversations. So first of all, if you are live, if you are catching the replay, most people who know me know that I'm here in New Zealand. I often catch replays. So shout out to Team Replay. Say hi and let me know. Uh, what your household is like, who lives in your house with you, um, how old your kids are if you have kids, um, do you have people working outside the home, working from home that maybe weren't prior to pandemic, just, you know, let's get a look inside <laughs> each other's homes. Um, and I'll share a little bit about me. So um, my, I'm married. In fact, in October, it'll be 13 plus seven, married for 13 years, together for seven before that. So I'm going to make it our honorary 20th anniversary. I think that's appropriate. Um, so my husband has a corporate job. He absolutely loves it. And when um, COVID and the lockdowns first happened here in New Zealand, he started working from home and he's been working from home um, at least four days, if not five days a week since March last year, which is almost, it's going to be almost 12 months, guys. This is bonkers. So that was a big um, change for us. He took over my office <laughs> in our bedroom and claimed that, and I am out here in the dining room, um, which, you know, was an adjustment. But so many great things have come from him being at home. Um, like, least of all is that in the mornings, we get up, he gives the kids breakfast, he packs their lunches, he starts getting them ready while I'm getting myself sorted. I'm getting up. I'm showering. I'm like, wait, <laughs> I'm just kind of getting pulling myself together, you know. Um, he takes the lead on that. And then I take over and he heads into the bedroom for work. And this morning actually is one of the mornings where he's gone into the office in Wellington and he was out the door at 7.30. And it was just me and this sick little two-year-old and my daughter who's five was still sleeping. She slept till 8.30 this morning. This is not common. Um, so those are my other two beautiful babies in the house, Mr. Two and a Half and Miss Five who started school last year. So um that is my household. I have young children still. There are expectations on them, but they're not, you know, they're age appropriate expectations. And I like to say that my expectation of my husband is no more than I would expect of myself. Now, as women and as mothers, we expect a whole lot of ourselves. <laughs> so I don't know whether that's a bit of a, a trick there, but I really think we need to lower the expectations we have on ourselves to look after absolutely everyone and be responsible for absolutely everyone. And when to raise the expectation that we have for our husbands, our partners, anyone else that we invite into our homes and into our households, because more than ever, these need to be safe, supportive places for everybody who resides in them. Okay, so join me, share your household, let's get some chat going. But I have a lot I want to share, more than we're going to cover in maximum an hour. Um, so let's get into it. <sighs> 
Right, the default household rules or roles that we have inherited from society, from culture, from history is that, and I am speaking as a white woman in New Zealand, caveat, um, that the man goes out and works and the woman stays home and is responsible for the household. Now, it was really, I guess, in the 1980s that more and more white women in particular were going out into the workforce and we started having the working mother persona and stereotype and all of the judgments that came along with that. Um, but I think the roles that we've inherited is one person is responsible for earning the money for the household and the other person is responsible for supporting and running the household because the person who's not there and is out working um, doesn't have the time <laughs> to do that um, and is not around to keep the household. Now, that's what we've inherited. That is not even 100% true anymore. We have begun shifting. And I know um, for a lot of women of colour, particularly in America, um, working mothers has just been the norm forever. Um, so I do just want to put that disclaimer on there and also acknowledge we all have different experiences. Um, you know, white women versus women of colour have different uh, societal roles and expectations that have been put on us. But where we want to get to is a place where it really is a family home and that the family all have responsibility and they all have a say in the expectations of how it is kept. Now, I do also want to say, you know, speaking to um, race, but also speaking to same sex couples and single mothers, fathers, whoever. I really, really, really think that this information and shifting our expectations of ourselves and of our future partners of even, you know, if we have maybe a parent coming into our homes to help support us and our children is so important to shift to this new paradigm. So, so important. So, and I think um, I've heard from other uh, friends of mine who are in same-sex relationships that these roles and these expectations still get uh, adopted by default. I don't think it's necessarily to the level that um, hetero couples do, but you still, you know, these are the defaults in the society we live in. And I think if we aren't conscious about it, we all fall into one role or another because it's easy, because it's what's expected, because it's what's generally understood, because we can go about our day and no one questions us and no one, you know, gives us a look or anything like that. So this is what we've inherited. We have started moving away from it. It does have lots of different shapes and forms depending on, you know, our own, um, you know, backgrounds going up and what you, whether we were raised by single mothers or working mothers or, mothers that stayed at home, whatever the arrangement was, but the default still very much is there for us to fall into. Now, whether we've fallen into it or not, whether we hate it or not, whether we've already been taking conscious effort to step out of it, I have a new idea of household balance to present to you. So my philosophy around what we want to shift into is that it really is a, a family home where it's not the mother of the house, like that's the traditional thing, right? The mother of the house, whether they're working as well as at home or not, the mother of the house and they are responsible for the well-being of everyone and the emotional happiness of everyone. And we're the ones that make the decisions and our word is law, which is a whole lot of responsibility and a whole lot of pressure that I don't really think we want, even though, because of the societal default, it often feels easier. It often feels quicker to do it ourselves, easier to do it ourselves. And if we can just think about it once and make the decisions and not involve anyone else, it's just a whole lot smoother. But it really, really is a trap. So shifting forward, I love the idea of everyone who lives in the house having a say on, do we care if there is a pile of laundry that needs to be folded sitting in the lounge? If I don't care, no one else cares that are living here, then, you know, let's fold washing once a week. Do we care about getting our clean washing out of the washing pile or our wardrobe? 
Some people do, some people don't. That really bugs me. So what I do <laughs> is I sort the washing, I pull all of my stuff out and hang it up and then leave the rest of it to be folded at a later date. I have a capsule wardrobe situation too, so I have a little bit less options. But the point of that example is, what do the people in your house care about? What cleanliness, what tidiness, what clutter or not clutter, what TV time or music time, what preferences do the people in your household have? What do they like? What do they not like? What do they care about? What don't they care about? Because a lot of the times we are just making assumptions. We are just guessing and you get the situation where we are upholding a certain standard that we think other people care about and they don't actually care about it, but then they are supporting that standard because they think we care. And if we just all had a minute where we asked each other, does this bother you or not? Does that bother you or not? What do you, how do you really want the space to be? Um, <laughs> I'm surrounded by Lego at the moment. I'm going to take, I'll take a little video and put it up on my Instagram stories. Because I'm in the dining room, but I've got like my daughter's Lego, like over there on the shelf next to me. My husband has a Lego project that he's starting. Um, and so I've just kind of accepted that the top of my sideboard is the like work in progress Lego station because we have a two year old in the house and guess what he loves to do? He loves to break it apart. That's not really the idea. Give it a couple years. We might have a different arrangement, um, but it actually makes me happy because it's not there's no other purpose for that space. And when I look at it, I think of the fun and the pleasure and the joy that my family gets from these things, but that also I get by seeing them and by participating and it being a thing. Um, so although it could look messy, um, they love it. I'm enjoying the fact that they love it and it's, it's tidy enough for what I need. Um, like I said, my husband's in the office today, so I have my two cuties. Hey, Dylan. Um, so that's really the oh, idea. Crackers and cheese are gone. Your crackers and cheese are gone. I want them again. You want them again, do you? Yeah. Okay. Have you had your mandarin? I did. Are you sure? Mmm. Okay. Well, I can get you some more after I've had my call, okay? Thank you. So think about for you, like, what is the idea of your household? And can you lower your standards a little bit as an individual because we come back to we aren't in control of other people really we can't force change on people we can invite them and i'm going to be talking more about this we can raise their awareness we can express our needs we can draw and hold our boundaries that we are not prepared to cross or have other people cross um, but ultimately, it really does start with ourselves. So we need to think, okay, what do I really care about? Or what am I maintaining? What sort of household expectations am I maintaining for other people rather than for myself? And there is a difference, I understand, between like your mother-in-law coming to visit and the house being a mess and what that might elicit in you versus like you've had sleepless nights with your kids and you just kind of don't care and no one's coming anyway there's an adjustment to be made and i mean i've got to a really great place where i feel confident and trust and know like and trust myself enough that i don't care who comes to visit or judges me on what they perceive my house should be like because I'm happy with where it is and I'm confident enough in myself and with my family that this is fine. And if you want to see a, a, you know, a pile of laundry that's not folded or not put away or dishes that are still on the bench, they're over there. Um, welcome to life. Like, let's stop putting up the facade in the first place and just create a home that we really enjoy living in and that creates time and space for us to do what we really like to do. Because there will always be laundry, there will always be dishes. If you have children, they will play, there will always be a mess 
of games, toys, whatever. And it's really about, you know, what are the rules? What is the standards that you, your partner, whoever else is in your household, um, really want to put in place so that you can relax in the evening and not have a look at a whole bunch of messy toys or not have to pick up after the kids all the time. Um, there's so many little details. So tell me in the comments if there's some things right away where you're like, I shouldn't care so much about this or I really hate doing this but feel that I have to. So let me know about those two things in the comments. Okay, now we're going to get into it. We're, we're in it, but let's get into the next topic. Mental and emotional labor. So one of the things that comes up as women is that we are inherently, subconsciously, I don't even know, we are trained through experience, through offhand comments, into this role that we need to think about other people's emotional well-being, how it will affect them, and adjust ourselves to that. Um, and this, this is something that has been very, like, invisible work, it's been called. Um, but it's something that is, as women and mothers, we've never had a name for it. We've never had words for it for the longest time. And so we've always struggled to explain it. It's like when everything builds up and you've got all these thoughts swirling around in your head and you're responsible for all these things, and then... Your husband leaves his socks out in the middle of the lounge for the 50 millionth time and it usually doesn't bother you but today you are maxed out and your brain is maxed out and you've been doing everything for everyone else and you just kind of lose it over the socks and he's just like looking at you like you're insane and it's like it's not about the socks it's not just about the socks the socks contribute but it's not just about the socks and at that point it just becomes this like blather of examples that don't really make sense that individually they are you know small enough things that they shouldn't matter shouldn't matter um they do matter fyi because all the little things add up and all the little things it's actually harder to keep track of a dozen little things than it is one big thing and the reason for that is mental and emotional labor. And you've probably heard emotional labor, um, these terms thrown around a bit more recently. And when we think about getting help or asking for help or delegating a task to someone, whether that's our husband, our partner, whoever, um, often we just delegate the doing of it. And I gave this example on my Instagram, well, across social media earlier this week about like asking my husband to post a birthday present. And I don't know that, I think I probably like bunched together a whole bunch of examples. I don't think he actually did all this in one go. Oh, that's so kind of her to give you some of her cracker. Oh, thank you. Um, and it was that, you know, you ask someone to post a package and then they ask you, okay, but where's the wrapping paper and where are the scissors and where's the sellotape? And then they ask you, oh, do you know the address? And then they ask you, oh, where's the closest post shop to go post it? And you're just like, if I had to do all this thinking myself, I would have just done the job because I could have done it all at once. Yes, I do know the answers to all these questions, but do you know why I know the answers to all these questions? Because I'm the one that wraps all the presents and buys the wrapping paper and makes sure that there's wrapping paper and has to put it somewhere. And I'm the one <laughs> who gets asked by the children, do we have more sellotape? And has to like ration out the sellotape for their craft. Sellotape is um, sticky tape. Sorry, that was a New Zealand term. Um, and we're the ones who usually post the packages. So we've already scoped out all of the post shops in our local area and know which ones are en route to what other errands we might be running. And yes, we do know what the addresses are because we have access to Google and satellite view and we can look it up. And guess what? They can too. We know all these things because we've had to do it before because we haven't had someone to ask. Now, admittedly, if we did have someone to ask that might be able to tell us off the top of their head or might be able to solve these problems, we would probably do that too. 
So this isn't like a woman versus men thing or whatever. It's purely we've each been given and trained in these default societal roles that we do not want anymore. And so we need to untangle one role and educate another. So let me give you the three layers of a task to really spell it out. And this is the type of language and explanation that you can then use to communicate with other people and be like, okay, it's not just about you taking the package that I've pre-pepped and, and addressed and driving the car to this post shop I've told you to at this time and dropping it off and coming back. Goodness gracious, if that was all the task was, like, that wouldn't be a problem. We could like just, you know, do it on the way to grab a coffee or something. <laughs> like, We'll get out of the house for five minutes without the kids and do it. Like that is not where the gains are for us. I think the mental and the emotional labor is far more impactful for us to uh, delegate and hand over than the actual physical doing of it. And of course, the physical energy and time contributes to it all. So let's talk about them all. First of all, there is the mental labor, the thinking about it, what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, remembering it needs to be done, putting something in place so that you remember it needs to be done. Um, remind, yeah, so reminding yourself it needs to be done. How do you want to do it? How did you do it last time? What's maybe a better way to do it that wasn't so painful? Um, what things do you need to have prepared before you can do the thing you want to do? Like, is there enough wrapping paper? Have you run out of sellotape? Um, all of those mental thoughts. One great tip, I'm jumping around a bit now, but one great tip is to start using your partner as a sounding board. So give the, the one of the biggest tips I have is to give them awareness and visibility of this stuff. Do not keep it hidden. Do not keep it in your own brain. Do not keep it invisible any longer because the more it stays invisible, the more other people don't know that it's a problem until it's their problem. And if you're raising children, especially daughters, this default will be there for them too, unless we dismantle it. And if you are raising sons, I have one of each, then we do not want them to be frustrating and annoying any future partners that they have by not being aware of this. So let's, let's stop. Stop, 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 stop keeping it invisible. So the first thing is when you're going through this, say it out loud. Use your partner as a sounding board. Just generally, um, don't keep it in your brain anymore. Speak it out loud. Let it be heard. Um, you can even say to your partner, like, um, can you just help me think through this? And you can just rattle it off. And you probably don't actually need them there. And how many times have we done that where we don't? But the important thing is for them to hear it, for them to know what thought goes into these things that just magically happen. So that's the mental labor part. The second part is the emotional labor. And so this is thinking, okay, this is even going back a step if we continue with the present example, right? What would this person like? What should I buy for them? How will they receive it? How will they feel about this? Um, if I, you know, if I use up the last of the sellotape and there's no more for the kids craft activity this afternoon, am I going to wear the tantrums or am I going to go get more sellotape first? Um, what else is there? Uh, we only have this kind of wrapping paper. And is that appropriate? Do they like dinosaurs? Like, I mean, personally, wrapping paper is wrapping paper. Like, if someone's got a birthday by like close to Christmas, don't wrap it in Christmas paper. Um, <laughs> but this whole boy girl business can go jump. Like, that's just a whole nother thing to decondition. But it could be that you really love wrapping beautiful gifts for people. And that's great. Um, and there's extra thought that goes into that. Um, other emotional things. It's all about considering what emotional reaction other people might have to what you were doing. And sometimes, yes, you were doing it for them. You were doing it on their behalf. Um, I'd argue that if that's the case, then they should be involved. And then you don't have to second guess anything. You can ask them. So, for example, if I'm buying a birthday present for one of my daughter's friends and she's five, she is the one choosing the present. I bring her along. I ask her, what does she play? What sort of games does she play with this, with her friend? What does her friend like to do? 
what sort of things does her friend share at news in the morning at school so she tells me the information and I guide and support her and then we go to the shop and I tell her she has a budget of like twenty dollars or thirty dollars or whatever it is and then um New Zealand dollars as well and then she will choose something and I this is another point I allow that I do not critique, I do not guide her, I guide her a little bit. Um, <laughs> I do not go, oh, that's not a good choice. She thinks about her friend, she thinks about what her friend likes to do, what she likes to do with her friend, and then she chooses the present within the budget I have set. So I am not taking on that emotional labor of trying to guess what this other kid likes that I don't even really know, what their parents might think about the things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing taking the, the present example with emotional labor is, you know, when are you going to post the actual present? Are you taking kids with you? Are you not? What time might suit? How is this going to work in around the other things that are going on? Are they going to be too tired if you do it after this? Are you going to cut into your work time if you leave earlier? Um, again, it's all of the thinking and consideration of just trying to second guess what other people are going to think and feel, which if we haven't already experienced is just a hard work and B, we're really, we're just, oh, we're, we're not going to get it right a lot of the time because other people's feelings and emotions are not our responsibility. Sure, we can be considerate and like not be a dick about things, right? <laughs> we can be kind and we can hold space and we can be empathetic and we can ask people to contribute. We can ask them if they would like something. We can think through what we know they enjoy. All of that stuff still completely stands. But it's when we go that extra level and feel very responsible for if we get it wrong, we are wrong and we're not good enough and we've done something bad and we need to do better because we should have known. We really can't take on that responsibility any longer. So that's the emotional part. And then there's the physical labor. There's the actual, I have all the things and I'm going to wrap the package and I'm going to write the address on and I'm going to take the box to the car and drive to the post shop. I don't know why you're getting all the actions and post the thing. That's the physical aspect, right? I need someone to wash the dishes. Okay, cool. But guess what? You still had to think that the dishes are there. You still had to ask someone to do the dishes. You probably still had to remind them to do the dishes. You probably still had to mention that that pot doesn't go in the dishwasher um, and that, I don't know, for them, you know, is there enough dishwashing tablets left or are we running low? That is the mental and emotional labor around doing a physical task. And that is the burden that we have invisibly accepted and that many, many mothers and women for generations have been accepting silently. And we will not do that any longer. And we will not do that. We will not teach that to our children as best we possibly can. And that is why I really want to share the language, the example, so that you can communicate that. And you can acknowledge in yourself that this is what's happening. Because often we'll delegate something, but then be like, oh, that was so not worth it. I should have just done it myself. The reason you feel like you should have just done it yourself is because you didn't delegate the mental and emotional labor as well as the physical labor. You just delegated the physical labor and you allowed the other person to come back to you constantly to ask you how to do it, <clears throat> what to consider. So you've given the physical task. You've not also given over the mental and emotional labor that comes with it. And that is the biggest reason why you get to the point where it feels like you just should, should have just done it yourself. It would have been easier because you're still exerting the mental effort involved. And it gets really frustrating. Now, I'm going to add in a fourth layer that I came up with this morning while I was outlining this masterclass. A fourth layer to um, the mental, emotional, physical labor aspect. And it's a little bit like the fourth trimester where everyone talks about the first three and then kind of forgets about the fourth, which incidentally is all about us as new mothers and physically like healing and also bonding with the small baby and all the things. So the fourth layer is our 
inner thoughts, fears about how we will be perceived and 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 or accepted or not accepted based on how we are doing or not doing the physical, emotional, mental labor. Okay, we now become the women who don't have the pristine house, who demand that our partners step up and you know work because we're working too so why not but also like contribute and we're the ones who are holding our children to a different standard and we're the ones who might have who our kids might have not picked the most appropriate um you know perfect gift for their friend and we don't care we might take our kids to sorry i love this example we might drop our kids off in their pajamas to school because they refuse to get dressed and we decide that that is not a reflection on us. But that is a huge process for us, a huge process of unlearning, of deconditioning, of coming back and trusting ourselves and our own beliefs that we are now changing something that is so ingrained in society, a lot of people still don't recognize and notice it. And being the ones that stand out and being the ones that do it differently. And there's a lot of like, fear around that there's a lot of like anxiety around that um to work through and there's a lot of just i know that people are going to give me the look and i have to not care and there is you know a journey to go through in ourselves in our self-belief and self-confidence and trust in ourselves that we don't care and people can give us a look and we can just kind of snort and giggle at them um <laughs> it's kind of like i said where i've got to for most things where i'm like all right you do you i'm doing me we're like in the midst of a movement here <clears throat> so that i say would say is the fourth layer as well that as well as the mental emotional and physical labor there's also a fourth layer of work that that we need to do to be able to accept help to be able to allow help to allow the people in our lives to hold space for the people in our lives to learn all of this that they've not learned before to practice it without us critiquing them without us like supervising and looking over their shoulders without us fixing it after they've done it um one of the comments in um, some of the social posts i shared uh was it was disempowering people and i think we do because we've taken on our households our children our husband our family unit whatever as a reflection of how good a mother we are how good a wife we are how good a partner we are um which is bullshit by the way so that's a whole nother layer that i realized this morning we really need to acknowledge be aware of and then start to decondition okay we're about halfway i think we're doing great um practical shifts okay so you're all just like uh-huh yes i know <laughs> now i can talk about it now i can articulate my frustration much more clearly etc hello darling um no push me in the back and we're trying to Sorry that he's been pushing you, darling. If the lizard is up on the ceiling, I don't want you climbing on things because remember Luke's got a sore arm. And you do your best to give each other turns of things, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> oh my goodness, it's so funny how often she just needs to like tell me and I don't actually need to solve a problem. She kind of, they know how to solve their own problems. They just, you know, need to be heard. Um, okay practical shifts. I'm glad you came at like a break point. Um, I want to give you some really practical things that I have done that have worked really well that you can also do and think through. Because up to this point, it's like, yeah, great. Now I can be articulate and angry about this thing that was really frustrating before, but I can't change it. There's like no practical thing. And that's how I felt when I you know, started this journey and read a few books. So the first practical thing that you can do, which requires no change of expectation of anyone else is let's create pockets of time hey ashling um let's create pockets of time 
to do the jobs that need to be done so we don't have to think about them outside of that time. So one of the first things for me that was always really frustrating and always made me feel really crap about like not being on top of things was like life admin, you know, like the mail that comes in or the random emails or those phone calls you need to make. Um, just the miscellaneous stuff that keeps, you know, life household running. And so I decided that I would do it once a week and once a week would be perfectly adequate. And if there happened to be something that couldn't wait a week, then I would do it right away and it would be done and sorted. But the number of times that happens is very, very, very few. And I've been doing this process for probably two years, definitely the last year with my husband heavily involved. So the first thing I did was I said, this is gonna be done once a week. I'm gonna do it on Thursday evenings for an hour or so on my laptop. I'll just pull everything together, knock it out. And do you know what? It means even any other time that the post arrives, I can just like open the mail, go, okay, need to action that on Thursday, put it in the same place as everything else. Okay, those emails have come in, that's fine. I'll leave them there and look and like action them on Thursday. It just shortens the amount of thought so instead of every day being like, oh, yes, I've not replied to that email yet. Oh, yes, I need to go post that thing. Oh, yes, I need to, oh, I don't even know. I don't remember these days because I don't have to do it. Um, <clears throat> instead of having those ugh, that ugh thought every day that, oh, yes, I haven't done that yet, which is a horrible feeling. It makes you feel bad because you feel like you should have done it already. So either do it right away if it's that urgent or just allocate a time once a week, twice a week, depending on like how much life admin you've got going on in your home and just leave it at that. If someone calls you about something, if someone follows up about something, you can say, absolutely, I'll take a look at that on Thursday night and get back to you. Hold that space and then hold that container and then allow yourself the space all around it to no longer have those thoughts. You receive it, you think about it once, you put it in the place that you're going to come back to, and you have a structure that will allow you to do that. Um, the same thing applies for stuff like the dishes and the washing and the actual like physical household stuff. Because guess what? We keep eating, the kids keep asking for snacks, there's always things. Um, so this is where we want to adjust our expectations, but we also don't want to be doing dishes after every single meal. Um, and so we say, for example, I'll do the dishes in the morning when I'm making lunches and feeding the kids their breakfast and I will tidy up the bench and wash the dishes and do the dishwasher and I will do that once a day every morning and the bench will be in whatever state it's in the rest of the day and that's fine because guess what, there's always going to be dishes. The same thing with the washing, it might suit you to you know, throw on a load of washing every evening and sort it out the next morning and it just becomes a routine and it never really gets out of hand and you don't really have to think about it. There's lots of like structures and strategies for these things and I think that's where traditional the make it easier for the woman of the house like <clears throat> advice has gone. But first of all, do you even